Welcome to the NFL Stock Exchange Podcast. It's draft week, baby. I'm Connor Rogers. That is Trevor Sikama. And we are excited to get, uh, to go today because we are doing our big board show. We're taking a little break from the mock drafts. But before we get into that, got to remind you right now, you can get a 50% off discount off the elite PFF Elite annual subscription if you use the code DRAFT50. It's draft week. So draft 50 will get you where you need to be. Uh, PFF's NFL Draft Guide, a completely unlocked mock draft simulator. That's mm. promo code DRAFT50 for a 50% off PFF Elite subscription. Trevor, that sounds pretty good to me. How are you feeling, dude? We are finally, finally here, man. Connor, the deals and promo codes are flying. The picks are in for the final mock drafts. If you guys missed our episode yesterday, we did a final predictive mock draft. And today, I'm so excited about this, man. You and I get to take a look at each other's big boards for the first time. I don't think the people realize that. Yes, obviously, yeah. we do this draft podcast together, and we talk a lot about the prospects. But you and I don't share big boards because of this very reason. We want to kind of make sure that we have our independent evaluation, that we don't get too much of groupthink with it. And we saved it on purpose until this episode. So today, I'm going to be looking at your final big board for the first time, and you're going to be looking at my final big board for the first time. I'm excited, man. This is going to be great. Yeah, it's going to be awesome, man. I mean, obviously, we go through 80 different scenarios. We've done multi-round mock drafts where we've seen some of these players that are a little you know, deeper into the draft. But this is where you start to get into uh, you know, rounds three, four, five, all of that. So, yep. And, of course, we, we're also going to have the consensus big board that our, our friend Arif Hassan opens up at The Athletic where you kind of get an idea of the entire draft media landscape, which is going to be interesting to see where you differ, I differ, uh, where not only you and I differ in some places, but how the entire landscape looks. So this is this is a really, really cool exercise. Yep, it's going to be fun. Let's dig into it right away. But before we get to that, we got to tell you guys about our presenting sponsor, our friends over at Jock Market. That's Jock MKT. Their whole motto is stop betting and start trading. It's a really cool way to get into the betting circle if you're new to it. Or shoot, if you're a veteran, it's a nice little change of pace. It's a great combination between daily fantasy if you play a lot of that and then regular fantasy football what i think well not just fantasy football fantasy sports whatever you're used to you buy and sell shares of players in real time for real money while games are happening all shares have a guaranteed payout at the end of the night essentially if you look at a guy and you go "Ooh, they had a juicy matchup tonight i'm gonna buy a couple shares i'm gonna throw some, i'm gonna throw some money their way connor didn't you have a bet that you placed last night on the mets when did you yeah, I think it? I had stock on Eduardo Escobar. I How'd don't think he I don't think he had a great game. Mm. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. It's true. Uh, it's true. Yeah, it happens. It's but, it's fun because it is, you know, it's sick. It's sickening in a hilarious way where I w the Mets, uh, the Mets had a pretty good eighth inning that I didn't expect him to get up to bat again. And when he got I was so excited that he got an extra at bat in there. You're watching every pitch of a right. <laughs> game on a Sunday. <laughs> It's a lot of fun, man. It makes it, those Sundays that much better. It is. It's such a cool way to have some extra skin in the game, kind of rooting for individual players, just like fantasy football, man. It's just so fun. You've got to check it out. Check them out on .com at uh, Jock Market. That's Jock MK, Kim, MKT com backslash PFF. They also have an app. That's how we use, uh, use our money and use our bets. If you deposit right now with the promo code PFF, you'll get 100% match on whatever your first deposit is, up to $100. Plus, you'll also get a PFF Edge subscription as well. Check them out, jockmarket.com backslash PFF or jockmarket in the App Store. Let's get right to it, baby. Let's do it. Let's dig into these big boards. Connor, I'll start with you. You take a look at my board, and we're not going to go line for line. We'll probably spend a little bit more time in a lot of names in the top 20, I would assume. But then we'll kind of bounce around a little bit. We'll scroll down. You got 300 guys ranked. I only have 100 because I was just kind of like honing in on it. PFF didn't require me to do a big board, so I just kind of narrowed well, you it down. you do it anyway, so you do get you do I get liked, credit. Right. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, but who, who stands out for you when you look at my initial big board rankings? I mean, where else to start? But number one, Derek Stingley, number one. I like that you're you're putting it out there. You're saying I believe in this guy's 2019. I, you know what? In this draft class, and, and I sit here as somebody that has Stingley at 17, and a lot of that is you know criminal. obviously factoring in. Yeah, that I am a, a uh, lot of thief, it is criminal. But, uh, <laughs> a lot of it is criminal. That's what it is. The injuries. I think that 
this is a draft class where there's no consensus guy, right? We all know that there's no player that you, you sprint the card in and say, this is going to be a building block for us no matter what. Um, or, or at least a lot of people think that. I do think there's one. But yeah, Derek Stingley at number one. I mean, you putting him there says that you think he's going to find that 2019 form, be this ball hawk at the next level, takes away the football, probably be a top three to five corner, uh, be a man-to-man corner and wipe out wide receivers. And when Derek Stingley is at his best, we've seen him do exactly that, and we know the kind of athlete he is. So I, that excited me, um, you know, that you're projecting him that way. And also Charles Cross at number three as the top tackle over Neil and Naquanu. I know you have them at five and six, so the gap's not massive. But right. I know PFF has been very Charles Cross heavy, and I've liked Charles Cross for a long time as well. While it felt like he was lower on, you know, bigger NFL media, more in that 20 to 25 kind of range, and I feel like everyone's come full circle on Charles Cross and, and he's going to be a big time draft pick. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll start with Stingley. I've got him at number one. Uh, you have him at 17. And then on the consensus board, he's at eight. So he's really <laughs> right in, the middle. in the middle of, of where we are. And it feels like we are on the polar opposite ends of the spectrum right here. It, you know, if you are, if you have more concerns about Derek Stingley and his long-term availability and what his, he's going to be able to show in the pros, you probably got him closer to where, Connor has him between 15 and 20. If you're dropping Derek Stingley further than 20, I I don't really know what to tell you. Like his injury prognosis wasn't that dire and he's incredibly good at what he does. So I don't think you should really have him any lower than 20. Me having him at number one, it's, it's quite literally as high as you could possibly go on him. And the reason why, man, is that I went back and I watched some of the tape from the 2020 season, which really was not bad. Not at all even the tape that he had last year. Yeah. You could tell he wasn't exactly himself, but he's, he had the injury that he was playing through and still he had moments on his tape, which were really good. The true tape for Derek Stingley, when we see him motivated, when we see a decent defense around him and when we see him fully healthy is 2019 and that 2019 year, I went back and I watched a couple more games recently over the last couple of weeks. It is so good, man. This kid is 18, 19 years old during that season. And he is doing that in the sec shutting down defenders the ball skills the length the patience the technique already is an 18 year old dude it was just it was insane how talented this player is uh, i went back and i watched those practice clips that people tweeted out of him versus jamar chase and we're all seeing how incredible jamar chase has been in the nfl and Derek stingley's out here at 18 years old just locking him down locking him down in practice man and just to, to, to have that kind of ability is crazy so i think that in a class you are right connor that has a lot of guys who you could make a case for for the number one overall pick or the top three whatever it is Derek stingley to me is absolutely in that conversation and the guy that i would have on the forefront do we want to before we do offensive line because i want to get into that offensive line conversation should I should I like read off my top ten? Should we like yeah. read off our top ten just so people hear that and then we get into the discussion? We won't yeah, do- and I would recommend. I, I mean, I'm definitely tweeting this out this morning, and it's Monday morning. This show for you guys won't hit you till Tuesday morning, right? So I, I would try to have these open as you listen today. I understand some people are working out while listening to this, doing things like that that you can't. It will help you follow the show a lot. But yeah, Trevor, maybe at least for now, just read the top 10 for those that can't have these open. Okay, I'll, you know what? I'll read the top 20 just so we can read out the top 20 and then we'll have you read out your top 20. I got Derek Singley at number one. Number two, I got Kayvon Thibodeau. This is obviously how I order these guys and how I think they're going to be pros. Charles Cross is at number three. Kyle Hamilton, four. Evan Neal at five. Iki Aquanu at six. Aiden Hutchinson at seven, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Uh, Jamison Williams at eight. Ahmad Garner at 9, Devontae Wyatt at 10, Jordan Davis 11, George Karloftis at 12, Drake London at 13, Jermaine Johnson 14, Trayvon Walker all the way down at 15, George Pickens at 16. That's right, baby. I'm putting my money where my mouth is with George Pickens. I got Dax Hill at 17, Trent McDuffie at 18, Chris Olave at 19, and then I got Tyler Linderbaum at number 20. So, Connor, why don't you read off your top 20 and then let's get into that O-line offensive tackle, those top three guys, that conversation, because I want to hit that. For sure. Iki Aquanu, number one overall. I, I do think he's a franchise cornerstone in this draft, and he would be my number one overall pick. Number two, Kayvon Thibodeau. Number three, Aiden Hutchinson. Number four, Evan Neal. Number five, Tyler Linderbaum. I do think he's a top five player in this draft. Number six, Jermaine Johnson. You could start to see the draft teeter off a little bit after the top five jermaine johnson number six sauce gardner number seven kyle hamilton number eight charles cross number nine 
Uh, we get a little bit of a run on wide receivers here. Garrett Wilson, number 10. Jamison Williams, number 11. Jordan Davis at 12. Devin Lloyd at 13. Traylon Burks at 14. Trent McDuffie at 15. Uh, Drake London at 16. Derek Stingley at 17, as you mentioned, Trevor. 18, David Ajabo. I'm still keeping him in the top 20 despite mm. the injury. Number 19, mm -hmm. Nicobe Dean, a player I don't think goes in the first round, ends up in my top 20. Oh, wow. And 20, Trayvon Walker sneaks right in there at number 20. Ooh, if you didn't have Trayvon Walker in top 20, that would have been a talking point. So that's smart on you. It's a better move. Did you sneak him in there? 20? Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, he I'm, gets kidding there. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So your offensive tackle order for the top three guys oh, where you had Icky at one, you've got yep. Evan Neal at four, and you've got Charles Cross at nine talk to me about each of those guys they're all three in your top 10 so clearly you think they're good football players but how do you come up with the order of icky at the top then evan neal in the middle then charles cross uh, icky separated himself by being a game-changing run blocker they're just the things he can do in the run game the other guys can't and and not a lot of guys that come into the draft can that it's as simple as that he's the closest i've seen on this level in the run game especially on the move since quentin nelson Somebody that he can wipe out anybody that's in front of him and he can get to the second level and, and take out other guys as well. So, and I think he's developed so much. How he got here, Trevor, everybody knew he could run block almost on this level. He took it to a new level this year. He developed so much as a pass protector going mm -hmm. from uh, 2020 to 2021 that he's on the right trajectory there where I think he's above average right now, but he could be really, really good if you give him two more years. Evan Neal... Uh, you know, obviously skyscraper tackle. I think I like him better on the right side. Really good drive blocker. Uh, really pro-ready pass protector. Very hard to beat. I do not love his balance. I think he ends up on the ground way too much, and those bigger guys often do. So I hope that's something that can improve at the next level. But his floor is a average to above average starting tackle. That's his floor, which is yeah. insane to say about a guy. So Evan right. Neal's in really good shape. And then number nine, Charles Cross. I think with him, his ability to recover in pass pro is unbelievable. He's got mm -hmm. really good feet and redirection to do that. You know, and I'm trying to bring up the bad on these guys just to show some, I mean, because there's not a lot of bad with top 10 players. It's as simple as that. For Cross, I wrote as a run blocker, he looks like a cannonball coming off the line of scrimmage into his assignment. I thought he was really, really good north to south downhill. I don't think he's as great in zone as icky was and not even close that that's a big differentiator um i think he could set a wider base i think rusher's got his outside shoulder a couple times and he doesn't use enough force to drive them wide these are all coachable things with cross he, he's he's a really really good player that a couple of nfl coaching tweaks away are going to get him into being one of the better pass protecting tackles in the league i compared him to joe staley a, a more compact athletic kind of guy that you put on the left or right side and you forget about him for eight years. So I got, I have Charles Cross as my number one offense tackle. I got Evan Neal at number two and I got Icky at number three. Now those guys are ranked three, five, and six for me. So obviously I as well think they're both, or think all three of them are very good. I'll start from the bottom and work my way up. I like Icky a lot. You mentioned he's got that run blocking mentality where he could just be an eraser in the run game. And, and I love the finishing that he brings to it. I thought the pass blocking definitely improved this past season there's no doubt about it and you look at a guy his that size who is really i mean he was a brute the year before like he was yeah. purely kind of just a run blocker and you go okay is this guy ever going to be more is he going to have that dancing bear kind of a, a a a tag to him and i think that he certainly improved in pass protection but sometimes when i was watching him in pass protection i felt like he was he was almost like doing what he was told to do, like getting to a landmark or just like kicking a certain way and getting to a certain spot. But then once if it was a better pass rusher who was going up against him and they hit a different type of move against him. And I'll specifically talk about, you know, like an inside move on him. Sometimes he was slow to recover because it's almost like in pass protections, there were times when he was doing what he was supposed to do, but maybe not, knowing exactly why he should do it or like be as in control as he was so that feel for pass protection is still something that i was watching with him that i was like okay i need to see a little bit more just natural instincts towards pass protection because he's doing what he's supposed to now but 
is he so in control with it? Is it second nature to him to the point where not only is he, is he doing what he was doing, he's supposed to be doing initially with a kick and getting to a landmark and, and walling guys off to the outside or whatever it is. But then also once he does that, he's in control of the counter as well. If he does that, man, he is going to be a really, really good offensive tackle in the he, NFL. He has one problem in pass pro that I wrote down. That is, it, it matters a lot, but it's very coachable. He, sometimes he stops his feet when he starts to throw his hands on outside rushes. And if you do that, you get caught reaching a lot instead of using this giant, girthy, wide frame, like you said, to wall guys off. So right. if he can stop that one habit, and it's gotten, it was really a big problem in 2020, and then I right. saw way less of it in 2021. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's kind of my thing, right? Like, it almost looks like, he was thinking a little too yep. much in his pass sets. And if it becomes more natural to him, then the feet keep moving, the hands keep moving. You know, your body's going one way, you're stopping, you're, you're countering the other way you're to try to mirror the guy once he hits whatever move he's going to hit on you. So I think that's certainly, you're right, all in the cards for him. It just needs to look a little bit more natural. But him taking that big leap this past year was really great to see. Uh, Evan Neal, obviously you mentioned it. I think the size is his biggest advantage. I think he has such a high floor offensive tackle. He could be played in the NFL for the next 10 years easy no doubt about it even if he doesn't hit his quote-unquote ceiling I think his feet you know to to quote Colin Cowherd which I saw people talking about this I I did think that his feet were somewhat slow compared to Iki Kwanu and compared to Charles Cross but that's because he is massive of a human yeah. being so I want to give like why full, might be a right tackle right that's why I, I want to give like full context to that like I think that's true but I also don't like overblow it like oh he's got slow feet he can't play in the NFL that's not true he just moves a little slower because he's got so much weight there in yeah. the lower half that's why he's able to anchor really well that's why he's able to redirect and you know flush guys out when they're going too far to the outside so I think that that is part of his game but ultimately why I didn't have him as my top offensive tackle the top guy is Charles Cross and you know, I think his base is a little bit narrow. It's it's it's. I watch him in the pre-snap, and I watch where his feet are aligned, and I'm like, man, are you going to be balanced with that? Like, are your feet like far enough apart? But then he he continually makes it work. He struggles a little bit when it comes to bull rushes and pure strength, but I think he adjusts very well. He gets knocked back a little bit, but I do think that he stands his ground eventually and he could hold guys up, which I liked. It's not like he was getting fully exposed by strength, which I think is important. Also something to note, Connor, when you, not you specifically, I'm talking general. When people say, oh, Charles Cross doesn't play with enough strength. I agree. He needs to get better at playing with strength. However, three years ago when he came to Mississippi State, he weighed 270 pounds. Now he weighs 305. And so it took him a year to gain about 15 pounds up to 280, 285. And then it took another year for him to gain up to 300. So he is still getting to that point in his body. So I think the best is yet to come physically in a strength profile with Charles Cross. And then you mentioned it. This guy just blankets people. I watched him versus Texas A&M, him versus Arkansas, him versus Alabama. And he's like covering these dudes, man. The pass protection ability that he has is amazing for a college player going into the pros and i think that's of course what's important it's a it's a pass protector it's a blindside protector you got to keep the quarterback upright on passing downs it's what it's all about that's the yep. most valuable skill and so that's why i got charles cross at number one all right where do we want to go from here because that was heavy on the top 10 yep. and the offensive linemen are an interesting breakdown um i i don't want to spend too much time on the top 10 i did find it interesting that you had Hutchinson outside the top five? Yep. I, I got Hutchinson outside of the top five simply because arm length is so important for edge rushers. Yeah. And he has seventh percentile arm length. And that's all it is, man. So much of the rest of this guy's game is really, really great. But the arm length, I think, is, is something that does worry me a little bit about him just being this premier edge rusher every single year. I think he's going to be a damn good football player for a long time me because too. of everything that he brings to the table and how high high of a floor I feel like he has as a prospect. But reason why he's not in my top five is just because he is not athletically gifted in an area that is really important for the position that he plays. So arm length, creating that separation, not getting locked up. 
it's, it's a way to create leverage. I mean, everything, there's so much that goes into arm length being used to your advantage. It's a big reason why people talk about Trayvon Walker as a potential number one overall pick because of the absolute pterodactyl wings that he has at over 84 inch in a wingspan. So that's really what it comes down to for me. So much to like about his game, but physically, I wonder how limited that he's going to be going into the next level when offensive tackles get bigger, faster, and stronger. And a lot of those things start to, those little X factor parts of measurables really start to matter. So that's why I had him at seven. All right. Um, do you have one on my board before I ask you about your next guy? I'm, um, I'm really excited for the next guy to ask about you, but if there's one on my board, fire away over here. You have, so I just, there are two guys and you can pick whichever one you want to talk about. You have Traylon Burks at 14 on yep. your board. Uh, you also had David Ojabo at, at 18, which you mentioned. But Traylon Burks, for me, was 31. And in the consensus, he is 20. So I guess he's a lot closer to you. But you got him 14, man. You got him in your top 15. So you love him a lot. I do. And I, I do understand that there is a risk factor I'm taking here that where he goes matters so much because he's not the kind of player that – like Garrett Wilson, if Jamison Williams was healthy, like Jamison Williams, or even like Chris Olave, that you, you know, you put out there and you go, okay, here's the routes we want you to run. Here's the things you need to know. And we're, you're just going to understand the playbook and you're just going to play out wide. Like he's just not that kind of wide receiver. He's somebody that you need to have a lot of different things on the platter to get the most out of him. Can he win outside and, and win the jump ball? Absolutely. I mean, there's plenty of examples of it on tape. Was he used in the slot a decent amount? Absolutely. And, and that's what he'll have to be moved into at the next level at times is a big slot weapon to get the ball in his hands quickly on catch and run opportunities. Do you need to script touches to him, manufacture gadget touches to him, pitch passes, reverses, bubble screens, everything like that. Yeah, you, you do. You need to have a plan for this guy. Now, with that being said, one, if you don't have a plan for players like this in the modern NFL, you don't have the right coaching staff. And there's a lot of them out there that don't. If you don't know how to use six foot two, 230 pounds of build up speed, tackle breaking machine, you're just living in an, in an offense in the NFL that's outdated. Unless, you know, you, you have a top five passer that can go out there and just carve guy carve teams up that's different not a lot of teams have that luxury right so i look at burks and i just like the weapon that he is but i also understand if he goes somewhere where a team goes yeah we just want you to be an outside wide receiver and do this it's not gonna he's not gonna perform like a top 15 draft pick it's as simple as that so yeah I, i'm worried that he's just only gonna be a big slot at the next level um and i i don't know what it came down to with arkansas why he wasn't used more as an outside receiver because so much of his production came from the slot so many of his his reps came from the slot and so i'm just i have my worries about his limitations about being this true chess piece now i think that his ability is unique clearly but I'm not so sure it's a guarantee like everybody says where you can use him as an X, you can use him as a flanker, you can use him in the slot, you can use him out of the, black, out of the backfield. I don't, I don't know if you're going to be able to do that at all times. He might be a unique mismatch opportunity player for you in the slot as a big slot player that you can consistently play there. But I don't know if he's this true queen on a chessboard that's, that other people maybe believe for him to be so that's why i think we, we probably differ a lot on that you have him in 14 again uh consensus was 20 and i had him 31 so it was almost right, uh, in, the like right in the middle we were on yeah. the we were on the opposite poles of that so okay who's the guy that you wanted to bring up oh man i just had it open drake jackson in the top 30 oh let's go baby drake let's jackson go, for baby. me um i need to find hold on one sec where I'll is find drake right. jackson I drake jackson even... for me is 71 and oh, on the old consensus board he is 62. 62. Yep. Uh, so you're definitely a little high on him. Now, what I liked about Drake Jackson is the twitch off the line of scrimmage. I think he can really stutter step and make tackles life's setting pretty difficult with that change of direction ability. What I worry about with this guy, Trevor, is, and he was a big time recruit. He made a freshman impact at USC mm -hmm. and we were waiting for him to take off after that. And he just never did. And that program was not very good. Uh, so that's, that's something you have to factor in as well. I just see zero power in this guy's game. And there are a lot of guys that win at the NFL level that are finesse rushers. But every one out of every 10 rushes, they could sneak in a little power or they could find a way. 
And I just, I have to, I have to wonder, is Drake Jackson going to find that, right? Is he going to find a way to develop any kind of power game that his body would suggest he has, but we just have not consistently seen? The weight is a big thing with Drake Jackson, finding that comfortable weight for him because I've I've said this before and I've even said this on the show. I think that he is one of the most underrated players in the entire class. And certainly I'm I'm putting my name on that by having him in the top 30. I think the flashes of what he can bring as a pass rusher with speed, with length, with bend, with flexibility, all of that is top of the class. I really do. I think that he could do some of that better than anybody else. You go with five best pass rush plays from Drake Jackson, and I know it. This scouting is, yeah. is much more than just the five best plays. But if you t- if you do the true, what can he what can he do for me? Drake Jackson will give you some unbelievable wow plays that uh, you, you would absolutely love and that you would covet heavily in this class. He's played at two fifty. He's played at I think two forty five. At the combine, he weighed in at 255. At his pro day, he weighed in at 270. Okay, well, he showed good athleticism. He showed good athleticism explosively at the combine with the jumps, and he showed really good agility while still being at 270 pounds when he was at his pro day. So he still has that athleticism. You're right. He just he's got to be bigger. He's got to play bigger. I think his home weight should be something around 260 pounds. That's what I think. Get stronger. Do what every dude does or whatever. When you go to college and you start lifting for the first time and you just bulk the crap up and then you just cut a little bit and you keep the strength, right? It's the old, it's old tried and true. It's the bulk and cut. That's what you need to do. It's what Drake Jackson needs to do. I think that he needs to find a healthy, comfortable strength at 260 pounds. And if you get me that, I think you are getting a really good edge rusher because he has those traits you can't teach. I just talked about Hutchinson. Not having that, like the the flexibility, the arm length, Drake Jackson has all of those things. He just, you're right. He needs more of a strength profile. He needs to find a home weight, something that uh, something that makes him really effective. It feels like he just like was never game. coached there. I don't know, man, because I was waiting for him to break out for two straight years. Me and again, too. The flashes kept being there, but they they were just flashes. And so this is a big bet for me. This is a big bet, but I got to say. Yeah, that. an interesting one. And truly a guy that I just almost became frustrated with because I was watching him every summer and I was like, okay, he's draft eligible. He's going to be in the first round of every preseason mock. He's earned that because he's so, he's so projectable to have a mammoth year. And he was the same exact guy. And he's the good thing is he's still young. He just turned 21. Yes. Nine, nine, six, six RAS. Great athlete. Yep. Uh, Didn't run the 40, but still everything else you factor into that really, really good stuff. So I, I, I like that you took him and Pickens and you really are projecting them in yep. ways that I have not seen on the consensus board, and, and, that, that, and that's that, a draft. That is important, right? Like I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to talk about this to give us a cop out or anything, but the point of scouting is to truly talk about what guys are going to be as pros. And I, I often think that myself included, I've been guilty of this certainly plenty of times before. You form a big board basically talking about like what these guys were as college players. And you've got to form a big board of what you think they're going to be as pros. That's that's what it is to me. And I, I think that I sometimes lose sight of that with guys and Drake Jackson, George Pickens. These are players where I look at what they were in college and I see so many great building blocks for what they're going to be as pros. It's why Derek Stingley is my number one overall prospect. Because people are going to go, oh, you only saw the good three years ago. Yeah, but... I saw that when he was 18 and he's still only 20, 21 years old. I still think that's going to be in his pro game. I think the best is yet to come for him. I think that certainly if he's healthy, we're going to see all that. So those are a couple of guys where projection definitely went into the equation for him and and, and how I ranked him here. Can I interrupt the big board show for one second? I I mean, and I know we've done this a million times, but Peter King's um, football morning in America article said the new lead P- of it new, P- new peter king just dropped new peter king just dropped babe wake up <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's too good it's too good i might have to try that on my girlfriend she'd look at me and be like i i, I hate you so much we should have that should be a reoccurring thing on the show we just say like hey babe new peter king just dropped and then we just talk about peter king you know what we need to do is we need to get Peter King on the show at point. And point so, I don't know if we say that to him, but we at least enlighten no, him. No, 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 no. We can't embarrass ourselves like that. But the <laughs> listeners will know. The sex addicts will know. Yeah, they'll know. So he said, expect a surprise, I heard out of Jacksonville recently. 
that would eliminate Aiden Hutchinson here. That, I mean, I know there's so much going on right now and smoke and it's draft week and I never really buy into things in draft week, but this has been a multi-week lead up with Jacksonville. We we did the mock draft episode yesterday, our predicted mock. And we had Trayvon there. And we had Trayvon going Which I'm really, I, I said I was 60-40 on that when we did the show. I, I would say I'm getting closer to Trevor's 65-35, 70-30 right. on that. Yeah. I mean, it's now, you know, the, the, crazy was this when we heard this a couple of weeks ago, oh, man. Oh, it's it's bonkers. Um, Just oh my gosh, I went on radio shows. I went on lot. radio shows and people asked me about it. And they're like, "What do you think about this Trayvon Walker stuff?" And I said, "It's it's it's crazy. It's nuts." He's a guy. Where do you have him ranked? You have him ranked twentieth. I have him ranked fifteenth. Yeah, I mean, which is to, totally fair of what he gonna, what he is right now. Right. I would say us having yeah. him in the top twenty is still projecting him a lot. To be a lot it's, better than what he was at college. That's yes. not even saying what he is now. Oh, man. He, and he's going number one. He's going to go number one. Man. I, I'll say this. If Walker goes number one, doesn't it feel like it makes the rest of the draft a little easier than what we've been fearing? Yeah. Hutch well, goes two. It, there's we no think doubt the Texans it, take Icky. There's no doubt it makes it easier because he's the ultimate wild card it's basically like what do teams think of him because if jacksonville was debating at number one between trevon walker and aiden hutchinson there's no guarantee that the lions were debating between trevon walker and someone else and there's no guarantee that the houston texans were debating yeah. between trevon walker and somebody else so yeah if if he goes one hutchinson goes two and then i think it gets a little bit easier after that for sure Man, it's just it's just interesting to me uh, that we're it, this is a lot of excitement around the you know what I have to admit it's not a lot of excitement around the number one pick it's a mystery like I'm not excited at the idea Trayvon Walker can go number one overall I like the mystery of it I'm not like oh wow it's true. this is sick it's true <laughs> like murder mystery suspense yeah, yeah. Great I just genre. had to interrupt the mock draft show for that because it a surprise could mean one of the tackles. I mean, who knows? Mm-hmm. Maybe they take Brees Hall number one overall. Who knows? Okay, all right. I'm just, Thanks, I'm just right. having fun. Back to the, back to the big put, board. Put Buffalo fans in a tizzy out here. Oh, okay, oh, so sniped. there are there are two players that you have in your top fifty-one. Oh, I did 51, not watch, folks. That I did not watch enough of to to rank appropriately. They are D'Angelo Malone, the edge oh, rusher from Kentucky, Western Kentucky. Sorry, and then Troy Anderson, the linebacker from Montana State. I watched Troy Anderson live but I didn't get to sit down and do a full study on him. So I, I did not watch enough either of either of these guys in a study format. So tell me all about him. Why are they right. top 51? I'll start with Troy Anderson because he's like my own personal Trayvon Walker. He really has no business being this high unless you're projecting him <laughs> to be. Where is he in the consensus? Hold on. Uh, Good question, actually. Troy, I'm very... 79. You're not that far off. Not that far off. But a lot of people are just projecting him because of the athlete he D'Angelo is. D'Angelo Malone is 108, so you're you're – you are that's com- the one you are comfortably 60 spots higher yeah. Than yeah. The consensus. i like him a lot all right uh, go ahead go ahead troy anderson you're talking about all an all-conference quarterback a really good college running back um that then got thrown at linebacker and is just figuring it out because he's so athletic it's insane his run and chase ability is nuts he is still kind of figuring out his run fits and will get caught up in traffic a little bit because he's just at a, a small school level that concerns you a little bit. But man, when you have this kind of athlete on the field that has barely played this position and looks pretty dang good at it and can run with running backs and can blitz a hundred miles an hour and can still, you know, be good, adequate against the run. I would take my now he's very scheme specific he is a linebacker that you're looking in a cover three scheme that you're asking him to really run around and make plays you're not asking him to come downhill over and over again and car crash after car crash that was that was the area that i watched him kind of struggle in. that's not him is a lot like physicality like real like box play if you will yeah this is another Traylon burks where the situation is going to make or break him and then when you look at d'angelo malone it's it's a bit of the same thing where if I was evaluating for a team that values bigger pass rushers on the edge, he probably wouldn't even be on my board. But I'm evaluating for the entire league of what these guys can do. I, I wrote an athletic stand-up rusher with an absurd amount of production the last three seasons. He's got about 27 sacks the last three seasons. Um, it, it's simple. He, he has burst, flexibility, speed as a disruptor. He kind of reminded me of like a shooting guard in basketball, and I said this about a Jabo before, that 
he gets guys isolated out in space and they, they can't touch him. They can't touch him. They can't get hands on him. He's bendy. Uh, once again, he's very explosive. He's very quick. I, I thought he had some of the best bend in the entire class to win on the outside. Uh, at that size, there's going to be limitations on the defensive line. At drive blocking is going to hurt him in the run game. He's not this hand-in-the-dirt defensive lineman at 243 pounds. But 6'3", 243, 4'5", 36-inch vertical. You know, I know Vic Beasley didn't work out long-term in the NFL, but it felt like there was a lot going on that had nothing to do with his talent with Vic Beasley. I mean, yeah. he's somebody we saw have a 16-sack season. So it was really about being locked in with Vic Beasley before he walked away from the game. D'Angelo Malone reminded me a lot of the good ver the good of Vic Beasley. Okay. All right. All right. Who you got on mine? You got any uh you got yeah, let's, anybody further down? Yeah, let's dive back in. Um one that I really liked from you a lot is how low you were on Christian Watson. You mm -hmm. had him on fifty eight. Mm -hmm. Um I Just had him yeah. at thirty nine, so I almost felt like I even started to get carried away and then I caught myself and then I just didn't want to start throwing the board around. I, they're just these expectations for Christian Watson that I don't know if it's coming from maybe there's a fantasy community angle of it because he could go to the Chiefs or the Packers or something like that. Maybe there is a, well, there's definitely that old 10 card on the RAS helps a lot. There's people right. that really are right. all in on athletes. Right, right. Trevor, he just he wasn't very productive at the FCS level, and his play mm -hmm. strength is is not even up to NFL standard. He's an yeah. awesome athlete. He's going to be really good if you give him any kind of space. I think he's going to get stronger. This kid was like a hundred and eighty pound recruit, I believe, out of Tampa. Um, oh yeah, baby, Plant City. Stand yeah, up. and he he grew so much throughout his time, you know, up at that program. But once again, there's just it's almost like a, a draft and stash guy to me. Like he almost needs. Not a redshirt year, but redshirt expectations where he's going to need a full camp. He's probably going to need a month or two. He needs an NFL weight program where he's got to get into rookie mini camp and get going right away. And he's getting bigger and stronger. And he's one of the freakiest athletes we've ever seen in the draft. Yeah. But it's just there are real football issues with him that do not make him a first round selection. You know, going back to the conversation that we were having a few minutes ago, when you're projecting these guys to be pros and not necessarily what they were in, uh, in college, I think that's really key for guys like Christian Watson. And you have him 39 uh, in the consensus ranking. He was 47 and I had him 58. And when I look at him at 58, there were so many times when I looked at him that lower on the rankings and I was like, man, I, I watched with my own two eyes with this guy did the senior bowl. You know, he's six foot four. He's 210 pounds. Like this, this dude moves like not many other players his size move. And I truly think that he will be a better receiver in the NFL than he was in college, sometimes because of him growing into his own body and his strength and his abilities, and other times just because of straight usage because it was a run-heavy system at North Dakota State. So I think that all of that's playing to his advantage. The thing that I keep going back to is that the natural ball skills – are sometimes really glaring at his tape. And I didn't see as much of this at the Senior Bowl. It's not like it was really sticking out to me at the Senior Bowl, which encourages me. But it's hard to naturally just get better at that stuff. You know, and especially when it comes to being deep down the field, 25, 30, 40 yards down the line of scrimmage, that's where they want to use him, right? That's your athleticism. You have field stretching athleticism and size. You're going to want to send this guy deep on nine routes, on posts, on uh, deep crossers, on things over the middle, like all of that stuff. And if you don't have the play strength to play through contact or go up and sky up and get the ball naturally, then how much does that ability really even help me if I can't trust you to come down with it? So yeah. that's my biggest worry with Christian Watson is the areas that people talk about him having a massive impact in the game. He's still got to come down with the football and he didn't do that as naturally as I wanted him to do as I was watching him tape. So maybe it is something that gets better with practice, but I'm just, I'm hesitant to pick a player high whose job it is to catch the football who sometimes struggles to yeah. catch the football. So, so that's, I, yeah. That's I right. found the uh, the NFL Stock Exchange player. 
Besides Kayvon Thibodeau, which isn't really that juicy. We yeah. both have him at two. And where is okay. he on the do, I do mean, we, are we are we planting the flag on this guy? How high are we talking here? Well, we we are because it's so funny how you and I have him ranked, and I swear Trevor and I had no idea about our boards at all. Nope, didn't see it till this. This player on the consensus is at 105. Okay. On your board, he is 61. And on my board, he is 42. Oh, Cam Jurgens. Cam Jurgens is a stock exchange. Uh, he's he's got about sixty spots for me and forty plus spots for you on the consensus. Well, we both have Tyler Linderbaum in the top twenty. Yeah, we're, this is a centers podcast. I never thought I'd say that, dude. I'm looking at these. Uh, okay, Tyler Linderbaum, Dylan Parham, Cam Jurgens. Where do you have Cole Strange? Because like I didn't mind Cole Strange either. Now I, I don't Probably think he's the a center, but like yeah, you have him seventy third. I had Cole Strange eighty ninth. All of these like athlete zone blocking scheme. Yeah, <laughs> we're playing small ball out here with our rankings. Okay, so yeah, Cam Jurgens, man, he represents a lot of the same things that I think Tyler Linderbaum does. He just doesn't do them as yep. elite. Yep. Um, but he's bigger. I, I would, yeah, and like for. Look, you got to start off by saying that Tyler Linderbaum's concerns already were that he was not playing big enough. So when you say that Cam Jurgens doesn't play as big as Tyler Linderbaum, then you talk about what his limitations are. But like, he is so quick. He is so smart. He can move so, again, if you are running any type of blocking scheme where you are getting your offensive lineman to move, either pull in a lot or in unison left or the right wide zone stuff inside zone stuff i think that he can handle those things really really well now i wanted to make sure that i watched his tape against wisconsin because i knew that wisconsin would put some big boys straight in front of him and he was gonna have to handle it and there's no doubt about it that when a bigger more true one technique zero technique nose tackle was up against his body at the snap he doesn't move him so like that's something that I think it's 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 a concern. It's something that you've just got to be aware of. But you know when those guys get up into him, it's not like he's straight pushing them or moving them off the ball. He definitely does struggle a little bit with strength. But there's so much of what he does from a quickness profile at that position that you really really love. So perhaps there's some added weight, there's some added strength that we're going to see at the next level. Because that athleticism in the middle, those instincts there, and his ability to get on the get on the move, they don't come around too often. It doesn't seem so. I really, I, I really liked Cam Jurgens. Yeah, yeah, they don't. And I'll say this, not to you know, little insider uh, expectations here. The stock exchange ranking of Jurgens is a lot closer to where he'll be drafted than the athletic consensus board. And that doesn't mean one's right and one's wrong, but prepping people for the draft. Cam Jurgens is going in the top 100 picks. I've heard Cam Jurgens is going in the top 70 picks. So, mm. yeah, so, yeah they, the go. league does value him a lot just because he is a zone specific center. There are a lot of teams running zone, and there are a handful that need center, and they don't want to spend the top, you know, they don't want to use a first rounder on Linderbaum when they have Jurgens as their, uh, you know, consolation prize in a sense. So, something interesting. Cole Strange factors into that too. All right, I think, what do you say? We'll do one more, yeah. you know, kind of pick around the board here before we get out of here, maybe move down the board a little bit. It's funny, we we ended up pretty similar. You have you have Dolchich, uh, like, tight end six and, like, ranked at number 96. I traditionally, this is something people might catch on that have followed uh, how I eval for tight ends for a while. Unless you're a freak freak, I don't like guys like this. And I have him at 96, so I think he's a player. He's a very role-specific player. Hmm. He's that poor man's Gusecki role, where he's only going to play out in the slot as a move tight end. He can be an effective pass-catching weapon on very specific downs. I would be very surprised with that high-cut body. What's that? That's valuable. I mean, it depends to who. I, he's not I, I Kyle guess. Pitts, you know what I mean? No, like, it, no, no, of course. I know of that's course not fair. Not. I've got him. Where do I have Dolchich? I have him as tight end two, but I have Trey McBride, Dolchich, and Jeremy Rucker all right next to each other. I got Trey McBride yeah. at fifty three. I have Dolchich at fifty seven, and I have Jeremy Rucker at sixty seven. So they are all right there next to each other, and I think all these guys bring a different little flavor to playing tight end. But I think they're all. Like I think they're all decent difference oh, yeah. makers I at like the next them. level. Yeah, I like them for what they are. Uh, okay. I just with Dulcich, why he did not crack that early group of tight ends is, 
you know, at that size, 243 pounds, he was a very average athlete. And I think that sometimes, you know, maybe in the pack, it looked like he was a great athlete. And he's a good player. He, he can be a tight end, too, as a pass catcher, strictly. Um, but I just like the guys that are doing the dirty work that could still catch the ball. And that was McBride, Ruckert, and Otten. Those are the three guys that just... And, and Ferguson. They kick the crap out of everybody on the line of scrimmage. And they catch the ball... Uh, all the time they don't drop the ball they catch everything right in the middle of the field and that's very boring of me but that's kind of the tight end I traditionally gravitate to I even saw the same with Daniel Bellinger and I guess my hot take in all of this I liked Charlie Kohler as a pass catching tight end better than Greg Dulcich I saw that yeah I saw yeah it's a good call out it's a really good call out I always forget how lower I am very interesting how people are going to see this tight end class I think all three of those guys can play really well if Jeremy Rucker turns out to be like the best or second best of the bunch I'm going to be absolutely kicking myself because I had Jeremy Rucker as uh either tight end one or tight end two for so long and then I was I was going over Greg Dolce's stuff and I was like "Ah." I was like you know just like what he does, it's just so many teams want this, and they're gonna, they're going to prioritize him, and he's going to get a lot of chances. Probably, you're probably I right. Think he's going to play well, and so I had him at tight end too because I was like, I like him. Now, yeah, the mock draftable stuff and the RAS for for Dolchich, it maybe wasn't as elite as as you wanted it to be, but I still think that it was fine. Especially, I think the explosive scores were great for him. I would have liked to see him run a faster forty, but. I, it, that's okay. So if, if if Ruckert ends up being good, I'm just gonna I'm gonna be kicking myself, dude. I'm just gonna be. That's gonna be one that I when I finalized the big board, I was like, I'm comfortable with it, but I'm mad at myself. Yep. For it. So I don't know. So that was. Do you have one more? Do we got one more? One more that you and I were higher on. Who I I love this player okay. now. Um, I think he's gonna play guard at the next level. Is Jamari Sawyer? You had him 71st. Yeah. I had him 58th, so we yeah. were pretty much eye-to-eye eye on him. The consensus board had him all the way down to 85. I, I think he's I, too low. I think he's a good player. I don't player. know. I don't know. Nobody talks about him, like, ever. I right. never and hear he, and he's, just, he's just good. He's a brute. He's just a pure strength O-lineman. He did everything they asked of him, whether it was at tackle, whether it was at guard. He was on a championship football team that could not really throw the football. And he handled That's how important he was. pretty well. <laughs> Dude, Jamari Sawyer, it, he is the classic, just a really good football player. Yep. So that was one that I was really uh, proud to see our podcast is representing. You know, he's short at 6'3". I, it's funny to call someone 6'3", short. Um, but he's 321 pounds, you know, kind of built like a fire hydrant. Arm length is not bad. He's almost got 34-inch arms. You know, big hands, strong, 31 bench reps, doesn't doesn't miss chest day. Jamar Sawyer, he played his ass off these last couple of years. I, yeah. I, yeah. He's one of the safest players to me in the entire draft, if you believe oh, he can fit your scheme. Okay. So. No, I, I had him up there, and I was like, damn, I guess I'm going to be a little bit higher on him. But I'm glad that you are, too, because I What's agree. to worry about? Like if, if you put him on the interior, the only thing that you would be worried about is, is he an offensive tackle? No, and he's I, not. He's and not. I hear, I hear you. I'd be like, okay, he's probably not an offensive tackle, but he's just a good offensive lineman. Kick him inside. Yeah. Those guys Tennessee, matter. Tennessee Titans. If you miss out on an offensive lineman in the first round, pick, pick Sawyer in somewhere in the second round, go up and get him. put him on the interior. Dude, it's, it's hilarious to me. He's just, he's going to get drafted in the third round. Nobody cares. He's going to start for eight years. And everyone's like, oh, that draft that there was like 85 <laughs> misses in the first 120 picks. Jamari Sawyer played a really long time. That's good. So yep. yeah, it's fun, man. It's really big boards are always fun. Uh, it really just gets off the rails after the top 50 guys. It feels like that's how much wide open territory there is this year. So this was a good show. It was good to get away from the mock drafts and kind of you know yep. do our thing. And I know a lot of people have been asking like, hey, can we get some more prospect analysis? And you know, to everybody out there, I, I definitely heard you. I read the comments. And we we both did. It was with with the podcast launching in January and then it going straight. We, we went straight into East West Shrine. We went straight into Senior Bowl. We went right into Combine Prep. And then it was like free agency, how that's changing things. Oh, and then we really, nuts. we wanted to get to the guest mock drive series. And hopefully you guys enjoyed that. But it definitely took up a lot of our time. So we're sorry we didn't get to as much of the prospect analysis as this podcast continues throughout the summer, throughout next season. We're going to get yeah. a lot more into that, we promise. And and I also want to give you guys the ability to ask some questions that maybe you want the answers to once and for all before the NFL draft. So on Thursday, Thursday's mm. episode is going to be the first ever that we have had on this podcast, Q&A. 
fan episode, whatever you want to call it. We want to hear from you. Check out our big boards, see where we have players ranked, and ask us questions about what we think about a certain player, where they're ranked on our big board, what we think about a position group overall, what we think your team is going to do in round one, in rounds two and three. Please don't ask us what they're going to do in day three on Thursday because we don't know yet. But ask us what you want to hear from us about your team when it comes to the draft, when it comes to prospects. And I'll set it up like this because this is our first one ever and we want to give people as much as, a, as, as much of an ability to get in onto the show as possible. I'll say that there are two ways when where you can ask questions and we will answer them. If you feel so inclined, you can do so on iTunes between now and Thursday morning. If you want to leave us the five stars, we would really, really appreciate Priority it. Priority questions. And right, if you leave us, fri- if, if you ask us a question on an iTunes review with five stars, we are answering your question in the show, like yeah. first and foremost. That that is that is the Disney Express Pass of getting your question like answered that. for this podcast. But then also on Wednesday, either sometime in the afternoon or sometime in the evening, I'm going to tweet out, "Hey, we're going to have a Q and A for Thursday's episode of the podcast, whatever." Or actually, I'll probably do that Tuesday because we'll be recording sometime late on Wednesday. So either way, look out for that. If you just have a Twitter, if you just see it on Twitter, you can ask it then. But if you want to make sure your question gets answered, five stars, ask the question on iTunes. Uh, We love y'all. Thank you so much for making this draft season unforgettable for us as our first one here on this podcast. Uh, Hope you enjoyed the mock draft episode. Hope you enjoyed the big board episode. The next time we speak to you guys, it will be day one of the 2022 NFL draft. Connor, I can't wait, brother. It's It's going to be awesome. I'm ready to go. Can't wait for the questions, too. I know you guys got a lot of questions pent up over the last couple of months. Get in on the show. We want to make this a jam-packed show for you guys. We will see you on Thursday.